morning, everyone. Good morning. Uh, good morning. Hello, everyone. Good tag. Welcome, welcome. Good morning, everyone. Bonjour. Hello and good morning, everyone. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Dobar dan. So, hello, everyone. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. We believe that as future adults, we can give politicians another point of view about the main issues we have to face nowadays. We are a new generation with fresh new ideas, but with the same main values of cooperation and unity that we have learned from the European Union. Everything also shows how much uh, the notion of inheritance is at the heart of contemporary questions and nowadays these conceptions of, of democracy and political action and as, as young people uh, it's, it's important. Thank you very much. The value of a united Europe is of vital importance for us young students as learning about the other cultures and discussing upon political, social and educational topics can make us feel part of something bigger than just ourselves. Good morning everybody. Welcome to the plenary of the European Parliament. Uh, it's an opportunity to have um, a dialogue with uh, 600, 600 uh, young people from 22 countries. My name is uh, Dimitris Papadimoulis. I am Vice President of the European Parliament. I come from Greece and uh, we work closely with the President David Sassoli, the other Vice President, in order to serve our duties. I'm Philip from Slovenia, and I would just like to ask you, uh, why do you think that populism is bad? I think that populism, Philip, is bad because it's based in fake news. Let's, let's take an example. Uh, in uh, some countries, uh, there is a distribution of fake news of hate speech. There is a misuse of the reality and the truth. And they have, they, they, we have people who uh, are presenting them, themselves as Democrats, although they want to bring Europe in a period from which we suffered a lot. I speak from the populistic extreme right which tries to uh, dismantle the European unification process, raising the flag, for example, of uh, safety. But if we want more safety, the only way to achieve it is to un unify forces supporting the human right to safety. If we have stronger cooperation also in the terms of safety, we could have more safety. So I think that now the problem is to have popular powers, but not populistic powers, based on arguments, based on democracy, and not to fake news, hate speech and propaganda. What do you think about uh, marijuana legalization or decriminalization? I do not have a personal experience on that because I didn't smoke either a cigarette in my life. But I think that according to the scientists, it has to be a, a separation between different kinds of uh, drugs. There are some drugs who have a very strong negative influence in the, in the public health, like opium, heroin, cocaine, and other who are softer. But on that, as you know, there are different uh, answers from different member states. For example, there is a different legislation in the Netherlands, like in Poland. And on that, there is no European common answer. I think that on that, we have to hear more, we, the politicians, the opinions coming from the science. You said that uh, the major threat nowadays to democracy 
is uh, the fake news and who do you think we can fight uh, this phenomenon at the European sc uh, scale? I think that the fake news uh, and also the use of personal data from giants of the internet, like we have the scandal of Cambridge Analytica and Facebook, uh, it's a danger for democracy. In the last elections, presidential elections in the United States of America, the majority of the news we, which were, were read in the social media were not real news, but fake news. I think that it's a global matter to fight against that industry of fake news. And I think that on that, in Europe, we have to work more and we have to do more united because only the European Union, united, the, all the member states, could create a superpower in order to fight that industry of propaganda, of fake news, of external interventions in our politi politics. And on that, there is a gap. There is a strong European deficit. All the giants of the internet belongs to other countries and to other continents, to the USA, to China, to Russia. So we have to invest more, not only preparing legislations and rules, but also investing in the new technology in the European scale. And on that, we need more money from a stronger European budget in order to transfer that political need and that political will into reality. You know that in, in this society that we live in, uh, I get the feeling that all we do is related in the end to money, to find the most economical beneficial thing and not to find real, really beneficial uh, solutions to problems. Like for example, in climate change, uh, a lot of enterprises uh, don't want to change to renewable energies because they want to keep making business out of oil. So how do you think is that a problem and how do you think a public institutions like the European Union can approach that problem and can solve it? If we put at first the common interest of the large majority of the people or the interest of the few who want only to get profits from the economy, big companies or bigger multinationals, I think that the climate crisis, the rapid change of the climate, proves that we need to change a lot in the way we are producing, we are consuming, we are living. And on that we have to put in front the interests of the large majority of the people and not the interests of some uh, big multinational companies getting profits from fossil oils, etc. On that, the European Parliament and the European Union has a leading role for some positive achie achievements are as the Paris Agreement. But we have also obstacles. For example, the decision of the Trump's administration to postpone his signature, their signature in that agreement and to fight against that agreement. So we have to do more and I'm happy that in that effort, your generation, the young generation is in the front line. There are millions of people of your age in all the globe fighting for uh, against the climate change and you have one from your age, the famous Swedish Greta Thunberg, who, who started that movement and now we have a strong pressure to us. I belong to the part of the political system who is investing uh, in changing our behavior in the economy in order to 
tackle the climate change, we do not have a lot of time. Time is running. And if we want to have a daily life good for your generation and for your children and grandchildren, we have to act rapidly uh, in the coming 10 years. Afterwards, it will be very late. In our current societies, we all have busy, hectic lives, and we also get caught up. A vast majority of people won't go out of their way to be sustainable. So we have to look, as the EU, we have to look at methods in which we can encourage people to, have, to live more sustainable lives. And basically, in our committee, we came up with lots of solutions. Uh, one of them included public transport. Basically, we suggested that the EU needs to invest in better and essentially cleaner public transport in order to reduce the burden it has on carbon emissions. Transport represents almost one quarter of the EU of Europe's greenhouse gas emissions and is the main cause of air pollution in the cities. We need to have specific regulation when it comes to transport, finding ways to encourage people to buy electronic cars instead of petrol and diesel cars. The, we need to encourage the EU to give direct subsidies to countries lacking in efficient public transport systems so that they can invest in more eco-friendly buses or trains. There was even a suggestion to make transport free or cheaper, which will hence, uh, which will hence encourage people to use public transport as a result. We talked about having white hack hackers who would help uh, in a cybersecurity task force to protect the citizen, the everyday citizen, um, from having their information being leaked um, or exposed to anyone they wouldn't have their information um, exposed to usually. So that would include uh, medical information, etc. We, we also talked about information, and the right to information, and how we should deal with information online. Um, so we talked about how we should handle uh, misinformation and how we should teach EU citizens to be able to handle and to traverse the internet responsibly. So what we talked about is having courses in EU institutions that would teach EU citizens, um, students and elderly people alike, the dangers of the internet, raise awareness of uh, what they, the risks that they face when they uh, use the internet, uh, stress the importance of the internet in, in our lives and also how to use it responsibly. So today, soft drugs are in most countries in the European Union uh, not legalized and they are also criminalized. But we came to the conclusion that soft drugs should be both decriminalized and legalized and from a young age of 16. And we also spoke that while uh, we want to make it easier for people to find soft drugs in legal ways and get their needs uh, fulfilled, we also need to work more proactive, such as in schools, where we need to educate young people on the effects of drugs uh, and the negative long-term effects that it has. And today we see that when people uh, or young fiends and youth uh, came, come in contact with this information, it happens in a very early stage and therefore we need to uh, sp uh, speak about this uh, earlier on uh, in our development so that when we are like in our early teens uh, we can get more information and be aware of what we're doing when we make the choice of like smoking a joint or so on. So that's very helpful. But we also need to work more with people who abuse drugs because today, when you have a substance abuse, you don't get faced with psychological help or medical treatment. Instead, you are sent off to prison 
where you most likely won't get help with your problem, but if you get medical help, you can continue as a pro productive member of society and actually contribute instead of feeling stigmatized and left out by uh, the community in whole. Uh, so that's the most important point. Um, so what we talked about, um, the main, the first proposition was extending the vote um, to those who are 16. Uh, the age gap has widened and it's more true now than ever um, that the different age groups have wide different needs. So it is important for us that also the, the youth is represented in the parliament and in all the other commissions, uh, in the commission as well. Um, the other issue that we talked about was uh, letting the citizen be more involved in the lawmaking process. Therefore, either let the Parliament of the European Union uh, make, law make laws or let the citizen vote for the Commission. The third issue uh, was um, unifying the educational system by creating a whole new united, unified European educational system. Um, as we, rec as we uh, recognize that um, most of the economical, uh, social uh, inequalities can be traced back to the different uh, levels of education that countries can achieve. Um, so if we increase budgeting for that, then uh, as soon as they um, enter a country, the migrants are being treated properly and under the right conditions. And then they also do things such as psychological and medical evaluations um, of the migrants and give the support that is needed. We also believe that um, the children, the children migrants, so uh, underage minors, should be treated in a more careful manner. They should, it should be a more delicate process in order to not traumatize and hurt them uh, and not leave them with long-lasting fears or trauma. Um, and we believe that migrants should have the opportunity to learn the language of the country that they're in in order to help them migrate easier and smoothly. Um, and if they're young and they're still in formal education, we believe that they should be able to continue their education whilst in the country that they're uh, seeking asylum in or migrating to in order to not disrupt their education and they can be a future asset to the country as they're educated and will have a skill set that will enable them to be beneficial for the economy and the country in general. And um, if somebody is in the middle of further education, um, including something like university and such, uh, that they also be given the opportunity um, to complete their university degree in the country, as they will be, uh, there'll be benefits as for mentioned. The third thing that we considered is student loans. So this is an option that is available in many countries, but many young people, students, are afraid to request a loan in fear of being in debt or not being able to pay it back. I can definitely understand this fear. However, if we make changes, this fear, I think, will disappear pretty quickly. The changes I mean are that when we take a student loan, we shouldn't be asked to pay for it right away. We should be asked to pay for it when we have, we have a stable and providing job, and we can afford to spend a certain amount of money each, each month in order to cover our loan. Uh, such student loan is uh, something that students can take advantage of until they step on their feet which will eventually happen when they find a stable job, as I said. And finding a stable job is a much more pleasant experience when you're not being pressured, uh, financially pressured, and when you're, not, when you're not in debt, and when you are not pressured into picking a job that is not right for you, just because you need the money in order to make a living and in order to pay your student loan.